Good afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome to a series first career highlights from Survey and Spatial New Zealand. My name is Jane Alberston. I'm the Professional Development and Advocacy Manager facilitating this session today with Bruce Walker speaking on high-rise buildings in Auckland. Bruce is probably known to many of you who are listening in today and, and will be possibly listening in to this recording. He's had many, many, many years experience um, doing work on all kinds of incredible iconic projects across uh, Auckland. And today we are going to hear of some of his career highlights which are not limited to, but include uh, the ANZ Tower, the Sky City Casino and parts of the Sky Tower, the Aotea Centre and the Metropolis Apartment Building and whatever else it is that Bruce is going to share with us today. Just a bit of housekeeping before we start. The way that we're going to run the session today is that Bruce is going to go over um, some of the highlights from some of those projects that I've just mentioned. And then we're going to have an opportunity for questions and answers. Uh, you will see that in this webinar format, you've got the ability to type some questions in um, and uh, I would encourage you to do so. If you could please um, just put the name of the project first and then the question and we're going to leave time at the end and, and we'll be selecting some of the questions put forward for Bruce to um, have a discussion about and, and, and answer live on this session. So just a reminder that um, for your question, if you can put the name of the project, for example, ANZ Tower and then the question and that would be um, fantastic. So without further ado, uh, welcome Mr Walker and over to you. Great, thanks Jane and, and hi to everybody. Thank you for joining in. Um, I hope we can make this uh, informative and interesting uh, from whatever uh, base you're coming from with your specialising in surveying, whether it's cadastral, engineering, uh, hydro or any of the other spatial um, Etc. So, um, uh, look, I, it's it, it is uh, the highlights of my career, I guess, that's been advertised as the webinar. But in reality, I'd like to think uh, that I'm sort of focusing on the scope and the actual works that were done in that era, and representing all the other people from all the other companies that were doing similar works. We would never want to paint ourselves as the only guys that did this work. Uh, we were one of many companies and have been historically down through time, including currently where we're still working in this work. Um, as you can see from the first slide here, this is a, a bit of a, a snapshot of Auckland where it sort of currently is uh, with, with its towers, which is quite vastly different to where Auckland was in the year 1980. Um, in terms of high rise, I think there was only a very minimal number, uh, perhaps the BNZ building. Um, or the QBE one you can see uh, right in front here. Um, that I'm not sure you can see my arrow on that. But um, uh, ones we've done over the years are the one on the far right, which we're focusing on today, the fourth project, which is Metropolis. And the second to last one on the left, which is ANZ Tower, which is our first one that we're talking about. Um, and there are a number of others there uh, that we have done and also uh, the other companies. And but before I get too far into it, I would like to acknowledge the other companies that have and are still currently uh, working in high rise construction surveying. Um, they being Harrison Grierson consultants who really uh, sort of almost wrote the manual, I would say, for high rise surveying in New Zealand. Uh, when we came in there, lead surveyor in this type of works was uh, Glenn Metcalf, who I hope is sitting in, sitting in today and listening as well. Um, Harrison Grierson probably led the charge, I would say, in terms of high rise construction surveying in New Zealand, um, uh, certainly through late 70s, mid to late 70s, I think, and early 80s, they were involved. Um, we came into it as a, as a part player, and we still are a part player um, in that scene, but certainly full credit to Harrison Grierson for with a New Zealand workforce that really weren't experienced um, traditionally in high rise buildings. Um, it was a, a learning process for the New Zealand construction industry and Harrison Grierson were probably the pioneers, I would say, of uh, developing the survey techniques required in a local way uh, to put up high rise buildings uh, straight and, and on the right spot. And uh, 
yes, on the right side of the street as well. Um, so yeah, full full credit to them. The other participants that are currently in the market are Survey Works, uh, Survey Group, and Barry Satchel and Associates, and there are others, but um, certainly we are a, a bit part player. We wouldn't want to represent ourselves as being the only people that do this work. And in, in any of these high rise projects, there is the, the construction survey part, which places the structure and the, and the construction works uh, purely to build the project. Um, but there are, is the other cadastral uh, part that follows either prior to setting the jobs up, and I'll briefly touch on that, or in the final stages uh, of the project when unit titles are created uh, in a cadastral sense. And the main players that we have worked in and around and alongside on projects uh, are Harrison Grierson Consultants, uh, um, Yeoman Surveying Solutions, Hampson and Associates, and Barry Satchel and Associates as well, and Chester Consultants. Uh, also doing some work in that area. So um, that is an important part. So, you know, on any high rise project, you can't claim to be the surveyor because there are often many other components and surveyors involved in a project. Uh, there are people that do the pre-construction typographical site uh, surveys in order for the design to uh, be placed on a, on a typical site. So you can have anything from three to five to six different parties involved in a project. The ones I'm highlighting, highlighting today are ones where we've had a hand uh, in the construction uh, setup of those, construction surveying and alignment only. Um, I'm a survey technician and obviously I haven't um, dealt with the cadastral uh, side of works on this. That has been left to the appropriate people who deal with that work, which are the licensed cadastral surveyors or back in the day registered surveyors. So look, we'll, without further ado, we'll move on to the next part now as after that introduction. And we came into this project um, as many surveyors did in the era on the back of the Think Big projects uh, around New Zealand. Um, they We'd done Tar uh, Taranaki energy projects uh, in the 70s, 80s. And in the 80s, we uh, worked at New Zealand Steel, which is one of the four big Think Big projects uh, the others being Motunui, uh, the Clyde Dam, and uh, Marston Point. Uh, on New Zealand Steel, we learned how to rub shoulders and work alongside many, many other survey teams with between 25 and 30 teams involved out there at times in the construction of the steel mill and its expansion, um, working generally to within two millimetres uh, as an outside tolerance. And of course, as you, can, as you can imagine, back in those days, it was working with um, mainly chains that were being tested. We always had chains and being tested each week and rolling one out. So we had a current chain that could be correction applied uh, to get very really good measurements. And uh, it took a, quite a bit of physical work to get good measurements back in those days. The EDMs were not that accurate. They were barely under three to five mils in accuracy at best, uh, depending on prisms and what equipment you had. So, it's certainly a different type of surveying that was done back then, but the, it was being relevant to today's webinar is those, those are the places that a lot of us uh, learned how to work to uh, significantly less than the cadastral tolerances that we had worked in, um, in training and working for um, cadastral surveying companies as I had in Whanganui prior to coming to Auckland. Um, it was a, a real lesson on how to, you know, um, lift our game in terms of keeping things tight and the techniques required to do that. This is uh, New Zealand Steel at Glenbrook. Uh, as you can see, a large site where the steam's coming out of the uh, uh, the stacks there. That is what's called stage one. Uh, and the part, uh, part over the back where there's no steam is called stage two. And um, uh, both, you know, require a lot of um, foundations, um, 14,000 piles, I think, on stage two and um, setting up in bolts that were seven metres long and, you know, 250 mil diameter and chasing two millimetres with chains and things in and around a, a massive, you know, 2,000 men and 65 cranes was took a bit of dealing with, uh, but it sort of bred us to be able to come and deal with the very, relatively small high-rise projects that followed in the years ahead. Um, and many of you will have had a similar background, I would imagine, at um, car rear, pulp and paper mill, uh, power stations, and some of the other projects that may be listening in today. 
Slide three, another view, stage two in the foreground, stage one in the background. Uh, stage two uh, from end to end was getting up around seven or 800 metres to control uh, project grid system uh, was applied there by Becca Carter being the, um, the project management surveyors on behalf of the client. Uh, and we worked uh, solidly on a project grid system on that job, which was to stand us in good stead, understanding how to apply that to other projects that we came upon, i.e. the AAT Centre and Auckland Airport in the early days. The mechanical installation, we were down to a 20th of a mil with installing um, uh, all the rollers, conveyors and the machinery, which in some cases was between four and six storeys high, uh, was brought in on special trucks from barges loaded up the Tamaki River on roads that were specially strengthened to get it there. So by the time they got it there, they didn't want to hear that the bolts were in the wrong place um, or, or out of tolerance. Um, and uh, that's final steel production. We have been in working not that close, but in the same building as a steel making process over the years. And uh, it's a pretty awe inspiring um, type experience to go through. And uh, certainly safety wise, you, you'll learn some skills that then apply to the next high rise job you might go on to, put it that way. Um, so getting into the high rise uh, projects that we were going to discuss today, uh, we probably may, we, uh, I haven't had time to get enough images to make Auckland Airport work, but I've got four projects here that I'm sure will cover um, and explain what we've done and why we did it and, and the, typically the, you know, the challenges that you encounter on a job, which I think is why probably a lot of you are listening in today to, um, to hear what those challenges are and how we overcame them. Uh, this first one here um, is the ANZ Centre, which uh, uh, in its day was the tallest building in New Zealand from when it was completed in 1991 until the Sky Tower was finished in 97, 98. Um, it's 143 metres in height, uh, but it does go down another six storeys below ground level. So it stands at 41, we, we always understood it was 42 levels, uh, 35 above the ground and, and a plant room on top, making it 36 and uh, six levels um, underground, um, making it a very, very deep hole that was dug there. Uh, they had a D9 bulldozing in the bottom that took some effort to lift out of the hole at the end of it. Um, but certainly in this day in 1989, that was a massive hole. The architects were some Sydney uh, construction began 1989 and was completed by 1991. Um, it was known as Cooper's Library Tower and referred to that, but originally it was called the Robert Jones Tower, being Robert Jones being the client for Hawkins Construction back in the day. Um, we were engaged um, to commence the works with Hawkins. Um, the hole was being dug. It was yet to be uh, dug down to its final uh, level when we were there. So we established control um, around the project um, and uh, were very careful to offset the control well up and down the Albert Street, which was based on, uh, and around the side streets so that if there's any movement uh, near the site with the survey datums that were going to be used day to day, we could come back and re-establish or confirm their values. Uh, it actually didn't move a lot. It's very, very hard sandstone down there. And um, we pretty didn't really have the problems that we could have encountered on another site with different geotechnical qualities. So um, uh, we established the structure, uh, the perimeter geometry, lift shafts, the extent of the curtain wall paneling, uh, set out of final granite and paving uh, and selected interior finishing works. Just move on from that one. Um, actually, I'll go back to that one. Sorry, people. Um, this, the boundary here that runs right through the letters C, C and C on the three lines of uh, Auckland, ANZ Centre, Auckland CBD, that, that corner there, uh, closest to the boundary was established by the architects as needing to be established at 33 millimetres off the boundary um, to the outside finished cladding that you see there. Uh, the, the other offsets on the southern side were, I think, uh, uh, over a metre for memory. Uh, but the 33 mils uh, was tight. It's tight for a 42 level building. Um, and the, 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 the 
big factor there is when we got into the cadastral side and examined the cadastral records, we found that there was a 65 millimetre misclose in the site boundaries. And uh, as you, you can appreciate, that gave us great concern uh, when you're uh, setting up a building 33 mils off the boundary. Um, and for a client that uh, was not uncommon to um, uh, take fairly extreme legal action if things weren't done on his project according to the to the book, if you like, uh, or to specification. So we, uh, and I, this is a strong point I'd like to make, we engaged the services of two independent cadastral surveyors to verify our coordinates uh, or our adjusted coordinates with the 65 mil site misclose, uh, adopting through in a number of ways, um, pretty much every which way you can uh, to confirm uh, the final coordinates to be used for each of the boundary points. Uh, the two companies were Brian Cowley Surveying and the clients' uh, surveyors, who at the time were Connell Wagner. And between the three of us, we, we confirmed uh, which were the appropriate coordinates to use with the 33 millimetre offset to the final uh, finished outside cladding. Then we needed to go through um, the architects being on a curve, as you can see from that image there, we then had to work out what the offset would be from the final cladding and the gap and the brackets back to the concrete to be established and therefore into the grid lines. Um, the grid lines in this case weren't established in terms of the boundary, it was only the finished cladding surface. So we had to really look hard at that, work out the grid lines and then confirm dimensions through other finished items across to the other side of the site and the boundaries over there as well. So we ended up reporting grid line offset to boundaries to the architects to confirm that the building would in fact be sited where it was appropriate. Um, before we start doing the first uh, construction set out works. And, and I would stress that as being a vital point with these jobs. Um, you don't want to start working and have hidden surprises um, partway through the job. Uh, that is not a good place to be on these sort of jobs. Um, so just going to the next stage now, um, I don't have any of the excavation uh, photos. This, this project probably has less photos available than any of the others. Um, I do apologise to that um, for all of you people attending today. They are, these jobs are relevant in terms of they were all unique in different ways and, and we certainly learnt certain lessons on each job, including that 65 mil misclose for a 33 millimetre offset building. But um, all of the buildings have unique features, which I'll be pointing out. Uh, this image here is when the job is it's up to level 42, which is the uh, plant room on top. That's level 41, the next major last four, full floor. Two tower cranes. Um, and, uh, of course, it started six storeys underground and took many, many months, I think about eight months to get up to ground level. Uh, it was quite complex through the different levels, starting off the foundations and doing the six levels to get up to ground level. The first few floors were, uh, I think, starting off at first floor, I think possibly took, I think it was about two weeks to build. The next one was a week and four days and then a week and three days and so on and so on. All the way up by the time we got to level 15, I think we were cranking out a level every week. And then above that, when uh, a lot of planning went in as to how we could, as a team, work around each other. And... Uh, we ended up doing a floor every four days uh, before the end of the job, uh, weather permitting. And that was achieved by um, uh, our experience on the building showing that it leaned, particularly in the upper levels, it leaned over uh, to the west by around about 10 to 12 millimetres during the day with thermal deflection, which obviously was worse than summer than what it was in winter, and straightened up again at midnight and settled into its mean vertical position. So we did all our plumbing up after a concrete pour, generally around midnight, particularly on the upper sections. And the um, uh, we often got on there with football socks on uh, and uh, little bits of wood for our theodolite legs or total station legs uh, that we were using then. And um, uh, the concrete was just cured enough for us to get underway. Uh, we'd plumb up through 200 millimeter uh, diameter core hole apertures at four different locations 
in accordance with the floor concrete floor pour pattern, which on the tower was generally two two concrete pours per level. So you on a high rise job, you always need uh, your apertures or uh, the, uh, there are the other systems, which I'll talk about in a minute in more modern times. Um, myself and Glenn, are still, we spoke about it yesterday, we still favour apertures, but I know a lot of uh, other companies, including ourselves, are using other methods now as well. Um, but that required uh, night work every time they poured concrete for us, but it guaranteed that we weren't trying to set, it, set up and establish verticalities on a tower that was leaning 10 to 12 mils to the west which enhanced the accuracy for, for the finished items, such as the panels you can see going up there, which were brought in from Italy. And uh, for the lift shafts that were being established by Otis at the time as well. Um, and believe you me, you you need to be pretty good with your setting out um, by the time the lift shaft guys come in because themselves and the curtain wall guys or the cladding on the outside are capable of picking up minor deflections if they can see the grids are not lining up um, by a few millimetres here and there. Um, so um, that was certainly a, a challenge, this job. But by working at night, we had a, uh, we had access to the alley mac that ran up the side. We could operate that ourselves and we could come and go with our gear without having to work around a big workforce. As we finished at sunrise each morning, uh, there'd be um, 60, 70 carpenters and labourers standing around the outside for our okay. They would then occupy the slab and we commence the next phase um, with people moving efficiently all over the place in order to set the next uh, floor up. And it was uh, a truly a joy to be part of a team like that, um, where we are just a little cog in a big chain of events that happen in setting up the next floor. Um, this is the layout of the building here. Uh, it was located in Albert Street, Swanston Street and Federal Street. Uh, that's the whole site around the outside edge against the street. And the Albert Street side is where the 33 millimetre offset was. Um, the, the columns are radial. So the setting out required perpendicular grids um, running project um, north, south, east, west but then there was a need to establish the um, angled columns accurately at each floor. So each column had its own individual offset um, with an offset line uh, established at one meter offset the column center uh, both ways so that the carpenters could measure off that and set up each column accurately and the right orientation um, at each level, which was, would have been continuous for the full 35 levels above ground level plant room was reduced just to the area around the core there. Um, there wasn't a lift shaft core on this one, as is typical on the last one that I'll be showing at Metropolis. This one had a core that was formed by the floors with, with a penetration or opening left for the lift shaft establishment. So the, the tower floors fall with a lead structure to go up each time with the columns. Uh, it was a lot of the there are other types of concrete high-rise buildings where the lift, car, lift core is set up first and the tower follows behind as the secondary structure. Um, going to the next one, uh, just typically what you've already seen. And the last one, looking at the back there, um, if you look down, you can see quite a big landscape area with structures and vents and, and, and a, another structure uh, sort of north left and slightly north of the building. It is a six stories of underground car parking uh, underneath this building uh, with a podium and then getting into typical office floors right up in the plant room on top there with the dome on top. Uh, the tower crane you see behind is not part of the ANZ job. It's a job we undertook recently about seven, seven years ago um, across the road from, from that site. Um, so that's pretty much um, completes the ANZ tower. Uh, I a bit lacking in, in some of our old plans and information, but as a, as a typical um, system to be used for the vertical control, this is off another job not far away, actually in Queen Street. And typically, the the two uh, three ring dots that are the same um, symbol as as for a sur uh, survey standard found on the cadastral lens uh, job, they are where the survey 
apertures, in other words, where you vertically plumb up using high-powered uh, optical instruments or lasers that can be uh, sent through those optical instruments, where the laser beam is down to about a millimetre wide um, and, and can be sent up from level 30, level 7 or 8 up to level 35 in one hit, which is quite good. One in 200,000 accuracy, which is a millimetre accuracy for every 200 metres you go up, which is certainly uh, powerful, but certainly suitable for these sort of buildings. Uh, we at each level we set up on the apertures and then set out the other grid systems with uh, back sites as indicated to either marks we've set up or features such as a church steeple or uh, a trig station as in this case we had many trig stations we could see but of course we couldn't see them at night so we were often relying on other targets uh, nearby uh, closer that we could see at night under lighting and, and using those for our back sites from the plumb points or the vertical um, grid transfer points that we had established that were tossed up from level with podium level they were at uh, and used to go up uh, to, for the full length of the tower. Through those we could monitor when there were, we could measure the deflections with thermal or when cranes were working they tended to pull the tower around a little bit as well but never, it wasn't great, um, it was never any more than 10 to 15 mils but we could determine whether a building was leaning over when we were doing activities uh, by using these core holes, which I kind of favour over some of the other systems, uh, which is GPS, GNSS and resection methods. If you've got a building that uh, is, is misbehaving for one reason or another, you can't beat the core holes for um, confirming that um, immediately. So that's that job. Uh, there's another one just to set out on the same one, just the grids established typically per floor. Here's another one with core apertures, um, four, three there, uh, sorry, two. Two, this is a job also not far away, just off Queen Street. And uh, there's the two core holes with the three rings and the other points that were established from each. In this case here, we it was down in a place where you couldn't see any trigs. It was hard to see out of here. So we, along the grid lines, um, at lower levels, we established points on buildings that we could orient, orient off uh, completely perpendicular with our grids um, to the north, south, east and west. Um, that required visiting buildings, took a little bit of time to set up, but made it really quick and easy when you're plumbing up at each level to get quick orientation and, and establish set out. Uh, same project with the grid layout. Um, just while we're on this job, I'd like to um, acknowledge the role um, and the ongoing support I've had from um, a registered surveyor uh, that worked for Harrison and Grierson uh, back in the day called Glenn Metcalf. Glenn, I'm hoping, as I said before, is sitting in on this meeting. I have uh, spoken with him. Uh, we've remained uh, close friends over the years since the works that we've uh, undertaken separately when he was working for Harrison and Grierson, uh, but we have combined in efforts over the other over the years since he left Harrison and Grierson and working on projects together. Uh, Glenn presented this paper, unbeknown to me at the time, um, to uh, the NZIS in 1989. And look, I've put it up here as a reference. Um, Glenn has given me his blessing to use it as a reference of people would like to study this. It is very appropriate to the times back then. As I say, methods have changed and there's a lot of automation uh, with technology now in the industry, but um, it, it goes through all the, all the different aspects of surveyor's role on, a, on the large jobs. And at the time, Glenn was doing the ASB job uh, just up the road from us. And there was a race between each of our contractors to put up the building first, which we were aware of. It was a little bit uh, competitive and a bit humorous at the time. I think they got there just before us, um, but ours were slightly taller. So there you go. Um, uh, we've got over all that now. Now we're good friends. So, <laughs> um, so the uh, it goes into set, the setup phase at the start, some things to be aware of excavation cranes, monitoring required, pile set out surveys, control for piles, pile as built. Um, it goes through the accuracies required and the equipment to plumb up vertically, uh, quoting the different types of instruments um, to be used particularly for the plummets. 
in their case, they established that the ZL, the wild ZL or Leica ZL as it became known, um, is one in 200,000. And that was uh, certainly um, the optimum equipment to have uh, if you're doing anything over 20, 25 levels, uh, which we, we all were at that time. There's the core there, which where, where there is a lift shaft core is a major component to establish position and alignment on projects. Um, it becomes the central structure of which a, a, a high rise project hangs off when you do have a lift shaft core uh, sent up. Uh, there's the jump forms down here, which are um, the uh, typical um, formwork um, structures that are used to pour the concrete. And then they, are, they can be sometimes automatically sent up with hydraulic jacks or they can be jumped up using cranes and re-established for pouring the concrete on the next level. Usually jump forms were only really used on cores back in the day, but now I notice on one of the jobs that survey works have undertaken uh, on the Pacifica project that was used for the whole structure to uh, pour all the columns uh, and, and the main walls and the main structural features as well as the core going forward. Uh, next page covers off different methods for vertical control uh, set out at the podium. Um, there's a page there on, on the various uh, components and I'd just like to just stick with this one for a little while. Uh, here we go for time. Yes, we're getting well through time. I better keep moving. Uh, elasticity, creep and shrinkage, uh, vertical control. Um, one of the big challenges on buildings is that they do, they, they settle or they sink with the weight. Uh, on the ANZ Tower, it was about 20 mils uh, measured at podium level. Uh, they uh, have, and that part of that's due to pile take up um, and then on elasticity below ground level. Up in the air, you have elasticity, you have um, actual shortening uh, with the weight. Um, a whole lot of factors that we didn't allow for and we questioned the job before they started and they said it won't it won't shrink and it won't settle. Well, it did. Uh, and Otis in their wisdom when they were coming in confirmed the shrinkage. Um, so the next job we went to of that size, which was Metropolis number four, uh, we did allow for that. Um, so, yes, going through the rest of this with Glenn, um, it, it will be interesting as a reference. Uh, Glenn was more than happy to use it. He produced it for... NZIS, and I'm sure um, he'd be more than happy to share it with anybody going forward as well. So moving on to the next job, um, we are running out of time, I notice we're getting well along. Um, the Sky City Casino and Sky Tower project, we were engaged to do the casino, but we only did parts of the Sky Tower. The main, the main part of the Sky Tower was undertaken by Harrison and Grierson, and they did a sterling job on that. We were involved with the foundations and the mast on top. Um, but we did the, the casino, which was six stories underground. And I'll go quickly go through those with you. Uh, there's the start of the hole. The excavation, it covered a whole block. It took on, at the time, I think they registered pretty much every truck in Auckland to be taking the soil out of there in a 24-hour cycle. Uh, it was, at the time, I mean, I know the city rail, and that's been massive currently, but in its day in 1994, this was a very, very, very big job. It had three up to three piling rigs going down either side, putting the retention piles in and uh, a massive dig out going on there. Uh, you don't see many trucks there, but you can see them lined up on the left hand side coming into the site one after the other uh, being loaded continuously. Uh, that was a big job. Uh, further here, you can see piling and excavation. Uh, getting more of the hole dug. The piling rigs are still working down the sides. Uh, further on with excavation, you can see the retention piles uh, are in place and uh, the machinery working around. A road has been built through the middle on what was yet to be excavated so the trucks could get through the site quickly and a system of excavators passing the soil up to finally load the truck from the bottom uh, where they had rippers and uh, bulldozers in the bottom ripping the hard sandstone. It wasn't an easy material to work with. There's the first of the, um, uh, the sort of the setting out. Uh, the, probably, possibly one of the two most challenging set outs I've had to do. Uh, those four tower cranes there. It's a bit blurry, guys. I'm sorry. It's about the best image I could get. Um, four tower cranes, which had to end up exactly in the middle of the finished lift shafts for the casino building. Um, 
and uh, it's it's a scary thing when you're setting out um, in a vast hole like that with nothing to relate to and you're putting a peg in and thinking well it's good this has to be in a lift shaft at the end of the job have i got my calculations right is there anything not good about my control is anything not good about my set out so needless to say uh, like the 33 mil offset uh, to the building on the previous job at ANZ Tower, this would probably up there in terms of one of the most challenging, nerve-wracking set-outs I've had to do, because the ramifications of having one of those tower cranes not in the middle of a, of a large building like this with an accelerated construction program was not really good. Uh, the outcome would have been um, quite disastrous on many fronts, including myself, ourselves. Um, this is well through the job now. Um, the, the tower crane there, which ended up in the middle of the lift shaft, for, fortunately, um, and the dig out commencing for the sky tower component. Uh, we were very much involved through this part. Um, we were involved through this part with the foundations. Uh, this is the foundations for the sky tower. And you can see the, uh, the large cages here that went down uh, 12 metres um and then came up with a smaller diameter uh reinforcing coming up for the legs of the tower itself so it was well anchored well down in the job against really really hard uh sandstone excavation this is the first concrete pour um above uh that foundation you just looked at coming out of the ground still digging out uh, excavating out of the edge of there um here is uh here is the part that um, shows the casino structure now well up. I can confirm confidently to you all that the tower cranes were definitely in the right place by now. Uh, it's much to our relief. Um, but coming out of the ground now is Harrison and Grierson's um, works with the main sky tower um, or the big pipe, as they call it, the big pipe in the sky, I think it was called at times. Uh, being round and cylindrical, it's now coming above street level. The uh, jump form uh, structure used is up there, and that would have had targets underneath it all from which Harrison and Grierson were sighting up with lasers to uh, establish and position that. Uh, they were also using a GPS unit on top, and they're also um, using a resection method um, off a number of other buildings, which I think we can come to shortly, to all as a redundant system. So they had they had three redundant systems there to cross check as they went up with, with that um, their alignment of that tower of the sky tower. Just another one there showing uh, our our casino, uh, the casino that we were working on finished, but the sky tower now well up in the air uh, and, and proceeding upwards and. Um, and Harrison Grierson, no doubt, their systems now are being uh, cross-checked and proofed. Uh, it shows at the top, at the beginning of the mast section, where we came back with the steel uh, contractor there, or subcontractor to Fletcher's uh, Grayson Engineering, and proceeded to do works with them in establishing the final mast there, precise levelling of bolts, etc., cetera, um, at each of the levels going up there. So, look, it took two years and nine months to build uh, Sky Tower. Um, uh, it just going down through there. It was. It, it could see when you're up on top there. You can see as far east as Great Barrier Island. You can see the Waitakere's obviously, and you can see south. Not over the Bombay Hills, but you can see over the back of Pukekohe. Uh, it was certainly um, quite, quite a spectacle to get up at that height. Um, and. No doubt there was there was just take that. There were um, um, you know certainly huge safety concerns in working up that height. It was designed at these points here. I do need to move quickly, guys. I'm sorry, I've sort of not allowed myself a lot of time, but it was it could move according to the fourth point here, one meter in the case of extreme weather. So um, uh, it, it had a certain amount of flexibility in it. This could cause problems, I believe, some days and plumbing the building up. Um, when it was leaning over, they did need to wait till conditions settled down. Um, it just re-establishing uh, re the methods used by Harrison and Grierson, um, resection uh, from three existing points, being the ASB building in its day, Mount Eden and the Coopers and Library building. 
to define the center point of the structure. Lasers also used uh, from the base pad of Sky Tower and then the um, GPS system uh, from seven global positioning satellites to confirm the position of the tower. Uh, just moving on to the Aotea Centre now, and I'll just look at time. Yes, we're getting well on. I better keep moving quickly with this. This was a large project in its day. This was actually 1985. Came into this one off the steel mill, um, and it actually didn't seem large after working on the steel mill, which was uh, up to a kilometre long in places. Um, but, but certainly this uh, was very challenging with its uh, geometry. And as you can see there, that the Aotea Centre is... Uh, was a leading uh, civic project in its day. It was controversial. Uh, the money sort of was raised as it was built. Uh, it was in the days when um, there was a lot of industrial unrest with the unions. Um, and, you know, it was it was a challenging job for any contractor to, to look at doing. Um, we worked on that project for four years. Uh, for many parts of that, we were there full time, given the geometry where a survey service was probably needed more than what is normal on a conventional perpendicular type building. Um, we went back many times with extensions and upgrades to the AAT Square itself, the underground car park, and then various bits were modified um, through the mid 2000s, 2010 I think it was around then, and then there was another major refurbishment we just finished working on. Um, the plans being in PDF, we had to um, uh, in order for the later designs, convert them to a 3D model, which required a lot of proofing and production of um, 3D model as built technology that we went through the, uh, the building with over about a two or three year period as required for design. This is the early excavation in 1984. Tower crane early phases coming out of the ground, uh, the Auckland Civic car park over there, town hall in the background. Um, much of the same there. Um, then the auditorium starting to take shape, uh, two tower cranes, and um, uh, the, the steel hasn't gone up as yet, uh, but certainly the concrete starting to get well advanced, the back of the auditorium, and that's the backstage area of that project. Here we are looking from the backstage area back out across the auditorium to the, towards the town hall, across Aotea Square. Uh, you have the stage area here, um, and the, the proscenium wall arch that goes over the stage there and the auditorium looking out there taking shape. Uh, at that point, steel still not gone up. Here's the steel fully erected, which ended up having a major glitch in that the world's failed and it had to be uh, re-welded in place, uh, which held the job up for some time, unfortunately. Um, and a lot of the rest of the podiums and the adjacent areas are well advanced by now as well. And here's the interior of the project um as it was finished uh, which stayed in this format through until the recent refurbishment where a lot of it got torn out and has been resurfaced and slight additions uh this balcony's come down um and and so the edging and the flooring and the granite has changed but we were involved the reason i brought this one up is different to a high-rise building we were used significantly more here because of the geometry but also with the pressure on the job to get it finished we ended up setting out glazing stairwells, treads, risers, um, handrails, uh, um, granite. Uh, we even set out carpets. That the pattern ended up running uh, at certain angles to doorways and things like that. We set out all the seating, uh, the lighting up in the ceiling in the, in the auditorium, which I'll show you. If you look up above there, it's not. It's a bit of a grainy, low resolution type photo here, but up, up in the ceiling, there was a massive amount of um, key structural points that had to be established using XYZ um, or 3D setting out back in those days. Um, and uh, that was, it was a huge amount um, of work required, particularly when there was scaffolding everywhere and planks had to be pulled out so we could see up through them to the points where boilermakers were working with the steel. Um, so yes, it's um, it stayed that way until 2013 uh, and it's, it was upgraded with a new uh, external face here um, and quite a bit of interior um, sort of upgrading and freshening up took went underway. There was a lot of surveying done by another company back in those days uh, in that contract. And we returned after that and uh, got ready for the another freshen up again all round, including quite a different um, uh, cladding covering for the auditorium, as you can see there. Um, 
and, and there as well. That was a lot of alignment work, 3D type setting out to establish all these angles and points um, by our, our teams, and including the interior works here. So this job's been a whole different uh, ball game after a steel mill and 40 storey buildings. It, it's, it's been uh, a, a really interesting, uh, probably this would be my highlight of all the projects because of just the connection between surveyors, construction surveyors and tradesmen required across a whole lot of trades. It wasn't just about working with border makers and, and riggers and carpenters at the steel mill or um, uh, uh, form workers and carpenters on the high rise. This one took on all the trades, um, right from, from foundation piling works right through to the glazing granite uh, type people. Um, and it really was a, a, a pleasure to be part of this project. We were one of, of many companies. Becca Carter were in here doing parts of it uh, from the project consultant team. There were other people came and went with some of the sub trades as well. Uh, so we would not claim to be the only surveyors on this project. Uh, this is the fourth project, uh, Metropolis, which was a 40 story apartment residential project. Jane, I'm conscious that my 45 minutes was up now. I'll just quickly whip through this. Uh, the difference for this one was it was uh, had a lift core. And as you can see there, um, and during the construction, that's the lift core coming up ahead of the towers. There was a supply problem with the units for the tower section. So the tower dropped behind and the lift core was sent up 22 levels ahead of the tower. The lift cores being narrow and small with the tower crane um, in the middle of it tended to move around and bend with thermal deflection during the day. Uh, up to 25 mils um, and with the ta with lifting a load in the crane as well. So all the plumbing for this one was done during the daytime, fortunately, but we needed to shut the cranes down um, and keep, and they had to swing around into a neutral position without a load in order for us to be able to plumb this one correctly. This is a jump form system there where you can see going around the, the lift core and that was positioned, um, which I'll show you a hand drawn sketch, sorry, people, um, in a minute. There we are, job nearly to the top, um, tower crane coming up, just down to one crane now. Um, the other one's coming out of the lift core, obviously. Um, and there's the finished product um, uh, in elevation. Um, there was a refurbished courthouse as well, an old courthouse building, which is part of the development uh, at, at the base there. And typically this is not the same job, but what any of these high rise jobs are, lift core up the middle and RLs established um for each level uh, in terms of the correct datum when which of course is with in Auckland's case was Auckland 1946 uh, level data and on this particular job we address the uh, coaxial shortening of the of the concrete building before the project started and we um, I've outlined here I haven't got time to go through it does talk about actual shortening uh, is made up of four components elastic ash actual shortening deep a creep actual shortening, uh, pile take up and shrinkage actual shortening. In other words, shrinkage is as you get a slab sitting, a house slab or any concrete slab will shrink in from each end as it cures. And certainly if you put 40 levels on top of one another, um, that you'll get quite significant shrinkage um, as well. So the consultants being Holmes Consulting Group uh, gave us indications of where they wanted um, the building to be set out above the design height in order for it to settle down. Uh, there was also the fact that the, the core went up ahead of the tower, which was then going to cure separately to the, um, the tower units that were being built significantly later. The amount of curing was going to be differential, um, and therefore we had to set out each of them at different heights so that they would both settle down eventually to the same height. Uh, so it got a little bit uh, complex. We did a lot of monitoring of that through the project. In the end, it proved that their calculations were good and everything settled down to its correct level. Um, look, it's in detail there. There's the layout, uh, three vertical grid transfer apertures. Uh, I don't sure you can see my arrow, but at the southwest, the northwest, and the northeast corners of the project uh, with back sites to all sorts of towers and buildings. And um, uh, we certainly were well and truly covered in the case of any obstacles to be able to carry out our set outs. It wasn't a good thing to not be able to do it, put it that way. Uh, here are the, for the lift core, we had a separate lot of vertical grid control apertures uh, through the jump form, uh, four. 
and they were cross-checking each time and we set an instrument up on top each time at a convenient location we're able to set out and confirm an as-built pre-pool post-pool uh, where the jump form was um, so that's pretty much all on that one um, so yeah sorry uh, let me get back to it now but, uh, So look, that can, that uh, that finishes uh, the slides there, um, team. I'll call you all, um, and I think I'll hand over to Jane now for um, any questions that she might want to raise with the time left. Sorry about that, everybody. I have run out of time a little bit on that. No, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Bruce. That was absolutely fascinating. What an incredible career you have had. Um, look, I do want to just let you know that uh, people have been so mesmerised by what you've been sharing. Um, there have been no questions come through uh, on the chat so far, but I do just want to say uh, we do have nine minutes left on this webinar, so don't be shy. If you want to put your, your questions forward to Bruce now, if you've got anything that you'd like to put to him, um, that would be fantastic. He's here live now and he'd love to, to answer it. I, I do um, just want to say uh, uh, that it's an honour to have you here, Bruce, and to have you sharing. Um, and to ask if I might, um, given that we, we're not necessarily going to spend this time uh, um, answering questions by the look of it. Um, I know you're a very humble man, but you, you've got an incredible uh, background. It would be interesting, I think, for the audience and for those listening in later to hear how you got in to the profession and and how you started and and where you are now. Just from um, uh, my my point of view, I know Bruce um, through our recent certification pilot program um, and dating back a couple of years to when he took on um, the first role ever, I believe, as uh, head of the newly formed technicians um, division for Survey and Spatial New Zealand. And uh, Bruce is one of our assessors uh, for our engineering surveying um, program. And it's just been uh, fantastic to have you um, with us, Bruce. But uh, uh, to encourage others and um, obviously the career pathway that we're wanting to, to build, is there anything that you would like to comment on or just tell a little bit um, of your story um, for a couple of minutes. Oh, there you go. Um, as to how you got in and what led you um, to being involved in all these incredible projects um, of which you you, you count the uh, AOT Centre, I believe, as being probably one of the one of the very top um, in your career so far, I will say. <laughs> um, yeah, look, more than happy to share that. Um... I think my background, I, I owe so much to so many people, um, starting from when I came into the job. Um, I didn't really know when I left school uh, what I was going to do, ended up being steered in the direction of surveying, meet with the surveyor, go out with the team. Uh, the surveyor was a, a well-known gentleman who became president of NZIS eventually, Hugh Gilbert, um, as well as another NZIS president, Ian Service. Hugh was not long out of Otago. Um, and, and working his way towards registration, a young man keen to make his mark in life. And he said, Walker, you go and find a peg over that hedge, please. And I did. And very keen to please on the first day out with the server, I found the peg and I pulled it out and I started walking back to him, ready to present him with the peg. Uh, whereupon the chainman uh, quickly came and intercepted and told me that wasn't the right thing to do in survey. Um, and put it back in the ground, and 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 Hugh Gilbert thought I was pretty good on that first day, uh, mainly mainly through accident and and the assistance of a very um, alert chainman, I guess. But anyway, I did enjoy the job and and carried on and got into the first uh, technicians um, uh, academic qualification, being New Zealand Certificate in Land Surveying, qualified in that uh, works for. Um, many years just in cadastral, getting into engineering, uh, earth, and then in earthworks mining at Waipipi Iron Sands, the Taranaki Energy Projects, and ski field development up Mount Rupehu in the late 70s. Um, I joined, and, and I'd like to make a point here, I joined the New Zealand Technician Surveyors Association. S technicians then were not eligible to join the New Zealand Institute of Surveyors, and so we had our own association. And I have to say that had a massive impact on me and my career joining with a professional body where we rub shoulders with technicians who are at government level with lands and survey 
They were Ministry of Works, Forestry, Railways, so they had a lot of government departments. There were private practice people such as ourselves. There were local government surveyors. And some of these guys, and they still exist, and they're still in the technicians division with us from those old days, they were flying helicopters with the Americans doing uh, control surveys at Antarctica. They went to the Q8 Iraq border and did setting out with lands and survey. They established trigs all throughout New Zealand. Um, it, it was a very exciting life that these technicians led, particularly in the large government organisations, the railways and all the others were doing hydro dams, major uh, works throughout New Zealand, Ministry of Works were building all sorts of things. And I, I absolutely lived on the stories that, that these guys shared with me about their works. So when when I had occasion to uh, take up a contract um, at the steel mill, um, I, I guess I'd been fired into life by belonging to a professional body. And, um, and it really did. And I would encourage any technician or any surveyor um, licensed or, or graduate from Otago or Unitech to join up with Survey and Spatial, get yourself into a division and a professional stream and get motivated like, like we all were in those days. And that certainly is what really got me into high rise. The steel mill was the first contract and the steel mill, those uh, all those contacts out there from a large project actually dragged us behind them into the high rise scene in town really. And so uh, it was it was like being part of a huge big construction family ever since and um, and and I mean it's a big one but it's a small one in New Zealand compared to overseas but that certainly was as be, being in the industry um, you you got credentials I guess for if your work was you know could be relied on um, and you were steady and sound I guess um, and I would say we haven't had our moments. Um, I don't think you've been alive or a human being if you haven't had moments of weakness, uh, but we've we've generally had a pretty good run. We have had the odd hiccup, but uh, unfortunately it hasn't been a major. But yeah, that's that's my background. And I, I just like to say the surveying community, particularly in the high rise, I, I owe a lot to the people that worked around us. And as I say, Glenn Metcalf, Harrison, Grease, and uh, all those companies, they were, they were role models for us. And, um, and you know, good on them they are still very very active and it is a strength in their businesses still fantastic well thank you so much bruce for joining us and um i think it's uh it's really great that you were the first in our series of uh career highlights i do also just want to point out to everyone listening in that uh that there is oh sorry there's a message has just come through to say thank you to bruce so there are obviously um, Bruce fans in the audience today. So a big thank you to you, um, Mr. Walker. And I do want to say thank you to you as well. I wanted to point out also that um, Bruce goes down in history, I believe, as uh, the second, at least in the top three from memory, um, to be certified as a professional engineering surveyor um, with, our, with our new certification in, in our pilot program. And I think um, that that is a that is a fitting place um, for, for you to have been part of that uh, program. And uh, what an honor um, for people to be assessed by someone um, as experienced as you, Bruce, and, and to have worked on so many incredibly complex um, and also iconic and meaningful projects across New Zealand um, and in other places. So a very warm thank you. And um, I believe that we're, we're going to be able to finish uh, now. So we're just in under the hour, but thank you everyone for joining us. Please keep a lookout on our CPD calendar um, for more career highlights. We have some more coming up. We've got some incredible members um, with some fascinating experiences and, and projects that they've worked on in all different areas. So thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you soon.